Good, or, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all, and welcome this morning. It's a very good sunny day. After the short rainy days before. We got a few announcements today. The first one, um, okay. The first one is uh, regarding Deacon. I think we are, we are all um, waiting for that. The session wishes to announce that following our request for nominations for Deacon, thank you for all those who nominated, and following discussions with the nominees, we wish to propose that Rob uh, Cotert be appointed in the position. If there are no lawful object, with, we, will seek to, uh, we will seek the congregation's affirmation on Sunday, that is the fortnight, 25th of April. So prayerfully, let's go on and uh, seek God's will in our church. Okay, the second one is, we would like to welcome new members uh, new members of this family that uh, have committed to uh, be with us and uh, be attending our uh, worship. And uh, we have, first of all, Maggie and uh, Swing Lee. May we request you to stand up? And the family. They have committed to be, uh, to be in this church to worship with us. And we thank you for that. The other family are not yet here. Yeah, let's see if we can wait for them. But uh, the other thing is the 60th anniversary of, have you seen this? That's the Wedderburn Christian campsite. It's the market day, 60th anniversary. Imagine that. It's been 60 years. And uh, for those who do not know the place, I Googled it, and it's... Uh, approximately an hour from here. It's uh, 15 minutes beyond uh, Campbelltown area, so it's the south area. And there will be, a f it's called the Family Day. There will be live music, there will be face painting for children, food, and there are stores too. And at two o'clock, uh, it starts at 10 o'clock and it ends at four o'clock. The Thanksgiving service will be at two o'clock. That's for the 24th. For those who, for those who receive the um, uh, newsletter online, you can see more details in that about it. We also have the updates on the calling committee, and we request Rinus to come and give us more. Good morning, everybody. The calling committee has been together and has been looking at a few options. The first option is calling a pastor from within Australia or New Zealand churches. At this time, there are 12 vacant churches within Australia. We don't believe that would be a viable option as this would only create a number of vacant churches within the denomination and also the time it would take, also would take a long time, as in the case of Blacksland, who were vacant for more than three years. The other option is, at the last classes meeting, I was given a profile of a pastor from South Africa. This pastor is eligible for call and would like to come to Australia. This pastor has been screened by the Committee for Ecumenical Relations and has been recommended for call within the CRCA. His name is Walter Smith. He is married and has two young daughters aged two and five. His profile is what we are looking for in St Mary's. The <laughs> calling committee also has seen three of his sermons and found him easy to listen to. 
Our next option is to have a Zoom meeting with him, session and the calling committee. If you would like to see his profile, you need to ask one of the members of the calling committee. And those people are James Fell, Cory Monsma, Taisma Ledam and myself. Thank you very much for that update. The other family who uh, uh, made their commitment to, the, to our church are, uh, you've seen, they've been here for a while, Denzel and uh, Jeanette with the two girls. Okay, well. Our verses for the uh, call to worship are 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, that says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And the second one is in Colossians 3, 1, which is related. Since then you have been raised with Christ, Set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God. Um, I'd just like to say, uh, share something about the first fruit. I got this from the gotquestions.org. It says here, when Jesus Christ was resurrected, he became the first fruits of all who would be raised, and we can also see in Colossians, um, one Colossian, uh, first chapter of Colossians, chapter 18, which says, firstborn from among the dead. The Israelites could not fully harvest their crops until they brought a representative sampling to the priest. They call that the first, first fruits, as an offering to the Lord. That's, you can find that in Leviticus chapter 23. This is what Paul is saying in, in the verse today. Christ's own resurrection was the first fruits of the resurrection harvest of, be, of the believing dead. The first, fruit, first fruits language Paul uses indicates something to follow. And something would be, uh, that something would be his followers, that's us. The rest of the crop, uh, that's us, the rest of the crop. This is how Christ's resurrection guarantees our resurrection. How good is that? Yeah? Let us pray. Father God, you are indeed our Father who is, can be almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, you know what we need, you know who we are, Lord, and we thank you for, because you love us, you did the greatest sacrifice that we have been reminded last week, the sacrifice of your only son, Jesus Christ, who is the first fruit, Lord, so that we have hope, Lord. Lord, we thank you again that you have reminded us to focus, put our focus on him, Lord, who is seated at your right hand. Father God, we pray that this truth will, be, will live in us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit to, whom you sent to live with us because you know that we cannot do it on our own. And we pray that this Spirit will always um, remind us of the truth of your word so that we will live joyfully in this world so that we can reflect you uh, to the to the world, Lord, as you want us to ref reflect you. All this we ask you in Jesus' name. Okay. Then the, um, we'll have this two songs and then a collection for local church, just one collection for the day. There will be no Sunday school because uh, it's a school holiday. 
Then we will get Paul to lead us with the congregational prayer and also the Bible reading. And we will be having the, the rest of the, um, the sermon and the rest by Laven, our guest speaker. And we also have our um, communion today. Thank you.
Bon, allez, on va se cotiser. Let's pray. Father God, in the turmoil, in the busyness of life, we can often forget about the purpose of prayer. We can often forget that there is much for which we can give thanks. We often forget that you are the giver, Father, and we pay much more attention to the gifts. So, Lord, where we've done that in our lives, we pray for your forgiveness. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us this morning to gather in, in fellowship and in worship. We pray, Lord, that indeed the time that we spend together here this morning will be a fragrant offering to you, Father. Lord, we thank you for the way things are working out with the rollout of the COVID vaccine. You know that there are hiccups. And again, it can be easy to focus on the negative aspects, Lord. We thank you for the way in which this country has been protected. We thank you that the rollout continues, Lord. But we acknowledge too, Father, that there are needs here. We acknowledge that there are countries not too far from here, Lord, whose financial situation, whose poverty means that um, without donations of vaccines, then people will go unimmunised and the virus will continue to spread. And we acknowledge, Father, that whilst we are an island, until all people are safe, then we are not safe either, Lord. Help us not to take that for granted. Father, all of us have family members and or friends that have been impacted and affected by this terrible pandemic. We pray for those who have lost family members. We want to pray particularly for Giovanna and for Mark in the situation in Brazil. Um, you only have to look at the news and to listen to what's happening in some of the South American countries, Father, to realise just how fortunate and how blessed we are. Father, we give you thanks for our frontline workers, for the folk who work at our borders, for folk who minister to those who are in quarantine, for doctors and nurses who are involved in the rollout of the vaccine, Father. We thank you for them. We thank you for their servanthood. And we pray for safety for them as well, Lord. Father God, we want to thank you for our elders. We want to pray for our brother Rob as he considers a call into the diaconate. We thank you that the church family has recognised Rob's gifts. We pray, Lord, that you are empowering him and use him wisely should it be the church's decision that Rob takes up the role of elder. We pray for his ministry of mercy. Father, we pray for our session as they use their skills to guide and to lead us. We acknowledge, as Renus has already said, that there are 12 vacant churches across the denomination in Australia. And so we pray for each and every one of those vacant churches, Father. We want to thank you for the work of the calling committee and we pray a blessing on their efforts, Father. We pray for the man of your calling, and if it is indeed Walter Schmidt, we pray for him and his family as it's not an easy decision to pack up and move thousands of kilometres away from family and friends and to relocate. And so we pray, Lord, that you open his heart to the call. And if indeed he is the man of your choosing, Father, that you'll make the path easy for his and his family arrival here. Lord, we want to thank you for folk who have made a commitment in a formal sense to their fellowship with us here at St Mary's. We thank you for Zwingli and for Margie and for Phoebe and for Jesse. We thank you too for Denzel and for Janet and the girls. We thank you, Father, the blessing that they have been to us here already. We just can pray, Lord, that we are open and loving and willing to accept new family members into your church here, Lord. Father, we, uh, we pray for those who are unwell. The list is extensive. We know, Lord, that there are people suffering debilitating and chronic conditions. There are those who continue to suffer quietly. We thank you, Lord, that um, for our sister Betsy up on the Central Coast, that the situation is not as dire as first thought 
and that whilst not curable, her cancer is certainly treatable. And in that vein also we continue to pray for our brother Ian and his journey with his cancer. We pray for Sophie too as she supports him and we pray for the wider family. Lord, we thank you for Ian's strong faith. We thank you for the way he reflects you in every conversation with which people have with him. We pray for Ross and Helen. We pray for Tinny. We pray for others, Lord, who continue to suffer quietly. We pray for those who, um, who are lonely. We pray for those who don't have the support of family members around them. We pray for those who grieve. We pray for those who are in spiritual and emotional and psychological distress, Father. Make us aware of their needs, Lord. Help us find ways that are meaningful where we can lift them up. We pray for those, Father, in the church family and, and I guess in wider areas where parents are quite elderly and frail, suffering the effects of dementia and Alzheimer's. It's a difficult road and so we pray for those families, Lord. We thank you for the time over the holidays that you grant for them to be together. We thank you that the borders are relaxed. We thank you for the opportunities to travel. We thank you for the opportunity to be refreshed. Father, we thank you for our opportunity to return first fruits to you, Lord. And we thank you for Phil's explanation of first fruits this morning. We thank you, Father, that there are few, if any of us, who are in dire or severe financial need. We thank you that you provide for us well. We pray for the work of the Committee of Management as they use your gifts wisely in kingdom work here in St Mary's. Father, we thank you for men who are willing to fill the pulpit here in our vacancy. We thank you this morning for Lavin. We thank you for his giftedness and his willingness to serve. We pray that you will speak to us through him. And that if we've already sung, Lord, that your spirit will change us to be more and more like Jesus. And it's in his name we pray these things. Amen. This morning's Bible reading is all of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 from verse 1. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence. Nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet... It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, 
He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Good morning, congregation. It's good to be here this morning to share God's word with you, but also as we break bread together. I guess there's no Sunday schools. I just see one little child there, and one of the brothers asked me, am I going to sing? And I said, well, there's no Sunday school, but maybe we'll sing for the little child. That's okay. The child is important, okay? And we're going to teach a song, and grandparents, you've probably heard it before, but uh, you can learn the song as well, and uh, also for mum. Okay. So the song is very simple. He made the stars to shine. He made the rolling seas. He made the mountains high. And he made me. And this is why I love him. For me, he bled and died. The Lord of all creation became a crucified And that's the focus of our sermon this morning as well. We're speaking about the cross and about Jesus and what he has done for me. So the song goes like this. For those that know it, you can join me, okay? He made the stars to shine. He made the rolling seas. He made the mountains high. And he made me. And this is why I love him. For me he bled and died. The Lord of all creation became her crucified. So that's a song we can sing for our children and to encourage them as we serve God. Just realize as I was um, listening to the Bible reading that I think you use the NIV. So I'm sorry, we use the ESV. So... When you hear some words a little bit different, uh, just remember it's still the Word of God, okay? So I'm I'm going to be uh, preaching from the ESV, and uh, the text for meditation is verses 4, 5, and 6. So please allow me to read that again. And if my brother can help me as I go to the sermon, when I refer to a text, if he can just come up, that would be great. Let me just read the ESV so it sounds a bit familiar as I go through. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Okay. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have sinned, everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The sermon is entitled this morning, The Servant's Substitutionary Suffering. Beloved congregation, on this Lord's Supper Sunday, and even as we also reflect back on past, the past weekend on Easter, I think it is fitting for us to focus on the cross of Jesus Christ. No tragedy can be greater than God's blameless, sinless Son being sacrificed without mercy in horrid crucifixion. And yet as a result of His suffering, His death on the cross, countless people will spend eternity with God in joyful celebration. Jesus himself will be exalted and all will recognize him as Lord 
to the glory of Fa- to the glory of God the Father, and eternal benefits are ours because of His sacrifice. Now, Karl Barth, I know he was a liberal theologian, but someone asked him, as a theologian, how would you summarize the Bible? I wonder if someone asked you, how would you summarize the Bible? What would you say? And this is what Karl Barth said. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Is that a familiar song? It's in our book of worship, isn't it? Jesus loves me, this I know. But I'm going to ask you another question so that you would listen carefully to me and we'll answer it at the end of the sermon. And the question is, someone asked Karl Barth to summarize the Bible and he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, but the Bible tells me. Let's go for Spurgeon. If Spurgeon had to summarize if he had to condense all his theology and knowledge of the Bible, what would it be? And to give you a clue, it's only four words. Four words. So listen as we go through the sermon this morning. So remember, you're going to be thinking, how did Spurgeon condense his theology in four words? Brothers and sisters, every time I look at Isaiah 53, I'm always reminded of the Ethiopian man in Acts chapter 8. And some of you may know the story of this Ethiopian eunuch. As he was in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah. And we know that as he was reading Isaiah, Jesus found him. And he found his Savior in Jesus But this Ethiopian asked the right question. And the question he asked, remember now in this whole scenario here, remember he's in his caravan, he's reading Isaiah. The Holy Spirit works in Philip's life and says to Philip, go to that caravan, go to that man. And Philip goes to this man, this Ethiopian man, and the Ethiopian man asks this question to Philip. Tell me, tell me. Who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And I love what Philip said. So in Acts 8, verse 34, that's the Ethiopian's question. In verse 35, this is what Philip said. He opened his mouth, and beginning with the scriptures that he was reading, which was at that time Isaiah 53. Philip said to this man, that Isaiah is talking about Jesus. Philip presented the gospel. Now, brothers and sisters, Isaiah chapter 53 in our Bible that Paul read this morning, Isaiah 53 is the heart of the prophecy of Isaiah in his book. Isaiah 53. It's the heart of the book. And the heart of chapter 53 is verses 4 to 6. The heart of Isaiah chapter 53 is verses 4 to 6. Now what would you find in verses 4 to 6? This morning, if you are searching for peace, you will find it in Isaiah 53. This morning, if you are searching for healing, you'll find it in Isaiah 53. If you are looking for righteousness, to be in right standing with God, you'll find it in Isaiah 53. You'll find justification in Isaiah 53. And if you're thinking that your sin is bringing you down, you'll find forgiveness in Isaiah 53. And if you're wondering, where would I spend my eternity? Isaiah 53 talks about it. You'll have eternal life because of Jesus. So this verse tells us about the suffering servant, the servant of God. And his suffering... Now, there's a big word we're using, but I'll explain it. His suffering was vicarious. What does it mean, vicarious? In other words, he did not suffer for his own sin. That Jesus suffered in the place of elect sinners. That Jesus suffered for our eternal benefit. 
So as we look at Isaiah 53, I'm going to keep it very simple this morning. As we look at the cross and what Jesus did for us, I'm going to look at it in three ways. Firstly, how does a sinner, how does a ordinary person, unchurched, look at the cross? What does he see? Who does he see hanging there? Secondly, God the Father. How does God the Father see his son hanging on the cross? And thirdly, we're looking at a believer like you and I, saved by his grace. And then when we look at the cross like this morning, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. We're going to look and say what Christ has done for us. How do we look at it? So those are the three things this morning. Very, very simple. Let's look at the first one, a sinner. Let's examine a sinner's reflection on the suffering servant. What does a sinner say when he looks at Jesus on the cross? Well, before I tell you what the sinner's estimation is, we've got to go right back to Genesis. Remember in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, this is what God told Adam and Eve. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You know the story? Adam and Eve did exactly what God said they mustn't do. They ate of that fruit, and we know that they died, not physically, because they were still alive then, spiritually, they died. And all the descendants from Adam and Eve, as we reflect, we all come from Adam and Eve, we have all been born in sin. And because we are born with a sinful nature, the only thing that we can do is what? Sin. Because of our sinful nature, we're born in that. Then let's fast track forward. In the book of Psalm, chapter 14, verse 3, this is David's summary of what happened in the garden. He says there, they have all turned aside. Together they become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Is those words familiar in the New Testament? Paul's theology? Romans chapter 3? What does Paul say? All have sinned. We've all fall short of God's glory. There's no one that does good. Not even one. You see, sin is the universal condition of mankind. Let's go a bit further to the prophets, Ezekiel. What did Ezekiel say in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4? Ezekiel says, The soul that sins shall surely die. This is the principle of Job as well. You know, Job's friends, this is the principle that they had. They applied this to Job. Remember, Job's children died. All his livestock Everything he owned died. Even his wife started to hate him. And Job, you know, suffered this horrible skin disease. And Job's friends came to this evaluation. This is what they said to Job. Job, you sinned grievously. Therefore, God is punishing you for your sins. And then, before I come to the sinner's evaluation... Let's look at Deuteronomy 21, verse 22 and 23. And it says there, And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he's put to death, and you hang him on a tree, you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. So now when people look at Jesus on the cross, they draw the same conclusion or the wrong conclusion. What do they say? This man is a sinner. This man deserves to die for what he said and what he did. This man is a blasphemer. He is under God's curse. That is why he's crucified. That's why he's suffering. That's why he's dying for the guilt of his own sins. Brothers and sisters, that was the estimation of this crucified Jesus. 
This is the estimation of all unbelievers. Now you can understand why Isaiah is writing these words in Isaiah 53. Let's look at verse 3 and 4 again. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. We considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. This is every unbeliever's estimation of Jesus. That man on the cross, he's a failure. He's a blasphemer. Let's not only focus on what the unbelievers say. What did the religious leaders who crucified Jesus, what was their estimation? Well, Matthew 27, verse 39 and 40 tells us. It tells us these words. And those who passed by ridiculed him. They shook their heads, saying, You said you would destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself if you, the Son of God, come down from the cross. You see, the idea is, brothers and sisters, they are saying, you said you are God's son. Now save yourself. And in the same way, verse 41 and 42 of Matthew 27, this is what now the religious people, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and the elders, they mocked him. What they told him? You saved others. Save yourself. What about those two thieves on the cross side by side? how they also insulted Jesus. Brothers and sisters, this is the way unbelievers of the world see Jesus. But what about God the Father? Secondly, let's consider how God the Father sees His Son. And the suffering experienced by His servant is unique. And it cannot be interpreted any other way than how the Father sees his son. And to understand the person and work of the servant correctly, then brothers and sisters, we need divine intervention. We need God to open our hearts through his Holy Spirit. And that is why Peter could confess when Jesus asked, who do people say I am? Matthew chapter 16. What did Peter say? Matthew 16, 16. Peter said, you are the Son of God. You are the Son of, the God, uh, Son of God. And verse 17 tells us, when Jesus said to him, Simon, son of Bar-Jonah, this was revealed to you by the Father. And so also you find in verses now 4 to 6. You see, in verses 4 to 6, we are given the divine revelation regarding the suffering servant. Contrary to other explanations, this one is not suffering because he sinned. This one is suffering because he is innocent. He suffers because of our sins. We sinned, he's crucified. We deserve death, therefore he dies in our place. We deserve death, but he dies in our place. And look at verse 4 again. It begins with the word surely. Now sometimes we just, in English, we, we read it and you know, we just keep moving on. But that word surely in the Hebrew, it's an interesting word because that word surely is saying the human estimation that you've just heard is not the correct estimation. That Jesus is suffering because he sinned, because he blasphemed. No, no, that's the wrong estimation. The word surely there is telling us there's an amazing truth. There's an amazing truth that's going to follow. And what is that amazing truth? Verse 4. Surely he has borne our grief. Can you see how the father sees his son? The father sees his son bearing our grief, our sins. 
And verse 3 says, This servant is a man of sorrows. He's acquainted with grief. How so? Verse 4 is the explanation. He is taking our griefs upon the cross. And without this divine explanation, people would assume he suffered for his own sins and griefs. But the Hebrew text says, he took up our sicknesses. He took up our pains. He did it for you and for me. You see, brothers and sisters, this is divine revelation coming from the prophet Isaiah. Don't misunderstand what Isaiah is saying. The transgression, the iniquity were ours. We revolted against God. We turn our back against God. We rebel against Him. And Jesus paid it all. And so when God says, you shall have no other gods, what do we say? We shall have other gods. When He says, this is the way we should go, we say to God, no, no. I've got a mind of my own. I will go the way I want to go. See, ours was the transgressions. Ours was the iniquity. Ours was the sin. Rather than please God, we please ourselves. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we all fall guilty. We all fall short. We all deserve to be punished. But amazingly, we are not punished. Aren't you glad this morning when you take the Lord's Supper? It's not a ritual. It's not something we do every month, part of our tradition. No, no. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are realized instead of love and being punished, He was punished. Therefore, this morning, when I take the Lord's Supper, I do it. Not because I feel so sorry for Jesus. No, no. I do it with a heart of gratitude. I do it with reverence. I do it knowing he did it all for me. And what was the manner of his death? No, no, it wasn't a decent death. He didn't just hang there and close his eyes and was over. No, verse 5 says he was pierced for our transgressions. It was violent. It, it, it wasn't something that did, you know, very softly and tenderly and saying, wow, you know what, this man, there's something different about him. Let's treat him differently than the other two Thieves on the cross? No, no, no. They pierced him. It was also voluntary that this servant gave himself for us. But his death was also a lonely one. He suffered alone while people just looked at him. Even his disciples. You know, when Jesus was arrested, immediately they deserted him. And Jesus did it all for you and me. And so, brothers and sisters, when you look at this chapter, you will see all these substitutionary words in it. And I'll just quickly go through it in this chapter. He took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. By his wounds we are healed. The Lord, verse 6, laid on him the iniquity of us all. And you can go right up to verse 12, and you will see Jesus taking it for you and for me. He alone suffered one in place of many for the eternal benefit of his people. And therefore, even if you look at the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 16, verse 21 and 22, where it explains how the, the priest would get a goat, he would place both his hands on the head of the goat, and it was symbolic of transferring the sins of the people of God onto this goat, and he would let this goat out into the desert. It was symbolic of placing the sin of God's people on an animal, on another. But brothers and sisters, this is substitution and sacrifice. 
But the question is, how can an animal substitute for a human being? Because the Bible clearly tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, it's impossible for the blood of goats and bulls to take away our sins. And therefore you find that what was happening in the Old Testament was pointing towards a perfect lamb, a perfect sacrifice. And that is why when John the Baptist saw Jesus as he was baptizing, and when Jesus was coming towards John the Baptist, in John chapter 1 verse 29, what does John say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then lastly, the believer. We come now to examine the believer's evaluation. How do you and I, when we now look at Isaiah 53, when we see the cross, the empty cross now, when we see what we're going to partake of this morning, what is our evaluation? Well, we no longer consider the Messiah a sinful man who deserved to be crucified. We now realize that this suffering servant is truly the Son of God. He is our Redeemer. He takes my place and your place on that cross. That as a believer, we have a new appreciation that we look at the cross of Jesus Christ and we say to ourselves, His suffering tells us that every sin that I've committed is against God. That every sin is so serious it has consequences. And today when we look around, you know, not many people use the word sin anymore. Today it's a choice of lifestyle. You know, that person does that because, well, that's their choice. And yet the Bible talks about sin. And we find that sin is rebellion against God. It's rebellion against God's rule. And so every sinner must experience the just wrath of God. And the cross of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, reveals the extreme wickedness of our sin. And this sin is so serious. And this sin needs to be punished. And what does God the Father do? He pierces his own son for you and for me. And that's why verse 4 and 6 is so precious to me and it should be precious to you. That he bore our sins. And we now confess this truth with, div with divine revelation because of what Christ has done for us, that we have peace with him. So coming back to the question that I've asked you, if we had to summarize, and if you ask Charles Spurgeon, to summarize and condense his theology, what do you think it would be? Four words. And that's what I want you to think about as you, before you take that bread and before you take that wine and you drink it. Four words. Never forget it. And the four words is, Jesus died for me. When I come before God one day and He asks me, why should He allow me into His heaven? It will not be because I was a pastor, I served God's people, I did this and I did that. The only reason why God the Father will accept me into His heaven is because Jesus died for me. Simple as that. No works, only by His grace. Why He died for me, I can't understand. But He gave His life for me. I'm so glad. And I want to live my life in gratitude for that. But maybe there's someone here this morning and you haven't confessed that yet. You haven't come to that point of saying, Jesus died for me. Then I want to conclude with another saying of Charles Spurgeon. And this is his pleading words. Do not refuse the Lord Jesus who knocks at your door. For he knocks with a hand that was nailed to the cross. 
for such as you. Don't refuse the hand that's knocking at your door that his hands was pierced for you and for me. Christ died for me. Amen. May I lead you in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you came, that you took my place. You took the place of my brothers and sisters this morning on that cross. Thank you that you went all the way for us. That you died that we may live. You rose again for the forgiveness of all our sins. And this morning, Father, as we ponder your word and pray that every one of us, no matter how young or old we are, no matter what positions we have in church, it doesn't matter how long we were members of this church, that we will come to that point acknowledging that Christ died for me. He shed His blood for me. His body was broken for me. His blood was poured out for our forgiveness. And God the Holy Spirit, won't you teach us more about Jesus, more about all that he has done for us, so that, Lord, we do not take your word and our walk with you for granted and casually and be complacent, but, Lord, we would live lives of devotion. And that, Lord, the way we live will demonstrate our gratitude. And so this morning, Lord, as we come around the table, as we partake of the sacraments, Lord, we do it with reverence, with awe, and yet with a heart of gratitude that you did it for me. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing a song just before we partake of the sacraments. Yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Thank you. Please be seated. For our time of preparation and also a reminder of what the Bible teaches about the Lord's Supper, I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 29. So I'll read off the screen so that um, it's the NIV and so 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 29. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So this morning, that's the Apostle Paul writing those words, teaching us, reminding us what the sacraments mean for us. And we do this with a heart of gratitude, and we do this knowing Jesus died for me. May I lead you in prayer. Merciful God, we do not come to this table trusting in our own goodness and virtue. We come because Christ has invited us. We come because we are sinful people in need of forgiveness. We come because we are hungry for life and need to be fed. Father, forgive us and feed us. We come in wonder and gratitude to offer our very selves to you in worship and adoration. Father, accept our praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. On behalf of Session, we welcome all full communicant members of this congregation to partake in the Lord's Supper. If there are any visitors amongst us and you are in a living relationship with Jesus Christ, you know that Christ died for you on that cross for your sins, then feel free also to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. So I'm going to ask the elders to please distribute the sacraments. Thank you. Beloved congregation, may I encourage you to look to the Lord and be strengthened in your faith. The bread which we break is the sharing of the body of Christ. I now invite you to open the first layer 
And just before you partake of the bread, so if you're ready, then I will give you the go-ahead, right? So if you're just ready. Take it, eat all of it. Remember and believe that the precious body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was given for a complete forgiveness of all our sins. Let's eat together. May now open the second layer, ready for the grape juice. The cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks is the shedding of the blood of Christ. Take it, drink from it, all of you. Remember that the precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. Let's give thanks to the Lord as I lead you in prayer. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bring you glory, thanks, and praise for all that we have seen and heard, tasted and handled of the word of life, for the fellowship with you and with your Son, and with all your people too. We humbly ask you to accept us, as we dedicate ourselves to you again. Help us with your daily grace that we may continue in this fellowship, that our hearts may be filled with new courage and hope, that we may live to your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you as you face a new week. And if you've forgotten all I've said from Isaiah 53, remember those four words. And what's those four words? That's it. Because Jesus died for me, I will be with him forever. I have peace with God. I think there's another song. Yes, we're going to sing the, pot, the potter's hand. So we're going to sing this song. Thank you. Yeah.
standing after the parting blessing we're going to sing uh, this kingdom the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine up and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and everyone said amen, amen.
anyway, um, anyone in the next Sunday?